Today, I'm speaking with Dr. Zalman Newfield. Dr. Newfield, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me. It's great to be here. Thank you. I appreciate you uh, being able to do this. And we're actually doing this late at night. Uh, this is the first video I've, video interview I've done late at night. So hopefully the caffeine is going to kick in <laughs> enough. I uh, just wanted to give a brief bio for you. For anyone that doesn't know you, Dr. Uh, Schnur Zalman Newfield is the Assistant Professor of Sociology in the Department of Social Sciences at the Borough of Manhattan Community College. He is the author of a book called Degrees of Separation, Identity Formation While Leaving Ultra-Orthodox Judaism. And he has a bachelor's in psychology from Brooklyn College, a master's in sociology from New York University, and a PhD in sociology from New York University. And you grew up in Crown Heights, the Crown Heights section of Brooklyn. Uh, for people that don't know that, for, for Jewish people, that town name means a lot. Could you tell us what, what is Crown Heights all about? Sure. So Crown Heights uh, nowadays and for uh, you know, a bunch of decades has been associated with the Chabad Lubavitch movement, which is a particular uh, branch of Hasidic Judaism, uh, which itself is uh, one part of the ultra Orthodox wing of the uh, the Jewish uh, world. So, in other words, it's a very kind of um, uh, politically conservative, socially conservative, um, and very kind of strictly. Uh, religious community, a uh, particular kind of strict religious Jewish community. And um, uh, so the, the Lubavitch Rebbe, the spiritual leader of the Lubavitch community, lived in Crown Heights, and that was sort of the headquarters for the Lubavitch movement since uh, around the 1950s. Um, and the, Lubavitch, the last Lubavitch Rebbe, Rabbi Menachem Mendel Schneerson, passed away in 1994, but uh, that Crown Heights is still the sort of uh, global headquarters of the Lubavitch community. And a lot of people know about, a lot of Jewish people certainly know about the Lubavitch community because they have, uh, under the leadership of the last Lubavitch Rebbe, they've sent out emissaries or missionaries all around the world to try to locate uh, less observant Jews and encourage them to become more religiously observant. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, you have of, um, literally, I mean, really kind of all around the world, you could find these rabbis with black fedoras and long beards and, um, you know, with the, their wives and many children. And they have set up, you know, shop in all different um, college campuses around America and, uh, and then college campuses really all around the world, as well as just uh, other communities um, all around the world. So Lubavitch has become somewhat famous um, and Crown mm -hmm. Heights as the center of Lubavitch has gained some notoriety. And is it correct that it started uh, in Russia about 200 years ago? So the Lubavitch movement, yes. Again, the okay. Lubavitch movement is one branch of the Hasidic movement. And uh, the movement of Hasidism began in the uh, 1700s under um, the inspiration of the Baal Shem Tov, uh, who is kind of the founder of this movement, which is a very uh, pietistic movement that basically tried to um, uh, reinvigorate the Jewish community in Eastern Europe that had suffered uh, uh, under tremendous amount of persecution of anti-Semitism. And um, so mm -hmm. this movement really believed that um, unlike uh, some other movements in Judaism that held that uh, strict adherence to Jewish law, the halakha, and um, you know, constant study of the Talmud, these ancient rabbinic texts, that that's really the focus of the Jewish religion. The Baal Shem Tov taught that actually, um, you know, spiritual devotion, piety, love of God, love of uh, one's fellow man, uh, fellow creatures, those are really the main things that Judaism is about. Mm -hmm. uh, and he inspired this movement and then uh, gradually, um, he, he had followers and then his followers had followers um, and um, there developed this um, complex system of different courts, different um, centers of, Has of the Hasidic movement. And they mm -hmm. tended to take on the names of the geographical location where they originated. So the Lubavitch movement got its name because uh, once it was founded in a particular town called Lubavitchi in Russia. Uh, so, um, so that's where um, 
so that's where the Lubavitch movement essentially uh, began or, or was really established. It was there for, um, for you know, it was there since the 1800s. And then uh, before World War II, the, the sixth Lubavitch Rebbe um, uh, uh, moved from um, from Poland to America, and then the movement kind of shifted to uh, to America. And there, it seemed like, from what I read, to the movement really kind of kicked into high gear after World War II in in Brooklyn. Yes. Yeah, so especially, um, I mean, it was you know somewhat well known. Um, you know, throughout uh, with among Jews, among uh, Hasidic Jews, uh, it was somewhat well known throughout its history. But um, <clears throat> under the leadership of the seventh Lubavitcher Rebbe, Rebbe Menachem Mendel Schneerson, he really um, focused on this idea of of um, uh, spreading uh, out uh, his you know uh, uh, throughout the world, so that his members would go all around the world to try to uh, meet uh, less observant Jews, as I mentioned, and that really uh, both increased the number of people in the movement. My Both of my parents grew up sort of regular American Jews, not especially observant, and then um, came to the Lubavitch movement, came to Orthodox and ultra-Orthodox Judaism through the Lubavitch movement, and then I went, uh, you know, through the entire uh, Lubavitch educational system and was, you know, very much a part of the community, essentially all because of the Lubavitch Rebbe's efforts to bring outsiders or less observant Jews into the fold. Um, so this, the, as I was saying, this um, effort to, to bring in outsiders both increased the numbers of Lubavitchers, but also uh, um, significantly increased their profile in the popular you know, press um, uh, among uh, um, non-Orthodox um, Jews and even among non-Jews. Millions of people all around the world are familiar with the picture of the Lubavitcher Rebbe because, again, he had you know these emissaries all around the world that were kind of attracting a lot of attention. And ultimately, people ended up writing stories and following um, the goings on within the Lubavitch community. In Heights. I've seen a bunch of videos um, in preparation for, for our chat about the main uh, house there in Crown Heights. Is that the one that you were in? So the 770, uh, yeah. it's among the Bavichers, it's called 770. That's the street address, 770 Eastern Parkway. And that's the kind of central uh, synagogue in Crown Heights. That uh, before the Rebbe passed away, that's where he would uh, pray every day. And he had you know, thousands of followers that would join him in these prayers. Um, in Crown Heights, uh, even uh, while the Rebbe was alive, there were tens of other synagogues, sort of local synagogues where people would just, you know, go to pray. And most of the times that's where my father and my family uh, went. Um, but we certainly went very often to 770. And I met the Rebbe, uh, you know, many, many times, usually from a distance. Uh, you know, the Rebbe was surrounded by thousands of other, um, you know, followers. But yeah, I was able to see the Rebbe, and the Rebbe also had a practice of giving various things to community members. So he would give dollars that were supposed to be used for charity. So I have a stack of thirty dollars or something that I got, you know, from the Rebbe's hand, and the Rebbe gave out the small booklets of um, um, a Hasidic thought. So I have a stack of those. Um, so yes, I was again very much a part of the Lubavitch community, the Crown Heights community. Um, and often visited 770. Mm, that's awesome. There's some some recent videos where um, a, a non Hasidic, uh, non Chabad person was was invited to come, kind of just see what was going on there. And I'll put some links uh, beneath our video if case anyone wants to see what that's like. Um, I do want to go back to the to the Rebbe and to to all that shortly, but I did want to ask to focus first on your story. So you grew up in Crown Heights, um, again in the heart of the ultra Orthodox Lubavitch. Uh, Hasad, uh, Hasid, uh, Jewish community. You, is it correct? You were schooled in the system, and that it, they believe that boys should only be taught Jewish texts and traditions, including prayer, study, Jewish outreach activities, and that that's pretty much that's the bulk of what they want you to learn. Yes. Yeah, so the Lubavitcher Rebbe himself was a very strong opponent of. Uh, 
uh, secular knowledge and especially um, of uh, having the followers in his community and especially the children and uh, the boys in his community uh, to quote unquote waste time on studying this secular knowledge such as English reading and writing, mathematics, social science, physical science, things like that, that they felt, and this is sort of connects to a long standing position within the Lubavitch community and within the ultra Orthodox Jewish community more generally that, um, that the, at best, these subjects are a distraction from the true, uh, uh, purpose of life and the true goal of education, which is to study the the wisdom and and, and knowledge of God, the Torah, mm-hmm. um, you know, the, the rabbinic teachings, and so on. Um, again, at best, it's a distraction. At worst, they they view it as uh, morally uh, uh, corrupting that this quote unquote uh, um, external or, or foreign knowledge actually is corrupting to the Jewish mind, to the Jewish soul. And because of that, the Rebbe was very much opposed to having um, the boys and the young men in his community learn any secular studies. Um, um, And it's interesting because um, this is a sort of a point of contention um, among different ultra-Orthodox communities. So within some other branches of the Hasidic community, as well as within or um, other um, ultra-Orthodox but non-Hasidic Jews, sometimes they do teach at least a modicum of secular education, if only to keep the secular authority off their back, uh, not necessarily out of a deep commitment to those subjects, but okay, at least something. Uh, Yeah. So you... The the Bavich community, the Bavich Rebbe um, was strongly opposed to... um, his followers really learning any of this. So I went to a school uh, in Crown Heights um, uh, um, on Eastern Parkway, a few a block away from from 770. Uh, the school that I went to is called Ale Torah, the Tents of Torah, and um, it was and st- its practice still is not to teach any secular subjects at all to any of their uh, the the. I don't know, 1,500 or whatever male pupils in the school. Mm-hmm. So it's all boys' school. Now, I do want to go back to the whole um, issue of, uh, later on, I'm going to ask more about the, the way that girls experience this, but just for a quick snippet, do the girls have a separate school or are they, is what happens with them or what are their options? Right. So the girls do have a separate school. I mean, the, the community, ultra-Orthodox communities in general are, are really um, kind of a sex segregated. So okay. uh, the boys go to one school, the girls go to another, the boys go to one camp, the girls go to another, they're, you know, summer camps. They're really, you know, very separate. Um, but are they similar um, curriculum? Right. So there, there are, they're similar, but there, there is, there are differences and, and one of them relates to, to what we're talking about. So all of my sisters who went to um, the equivalent, the female equivalent of the, the boys yeshivas that I went to, those schools did have a full, uh, again, full is sort of in, um, with an asterisk, um, but, but really relatively full um, secular education. So they, they mm-hmm. learned English, they learned math, they learned history, they learned science, and they even took, um, uh, you know, the New York Regents, the kind of standard um, high school, um, I don't know, exit exam or whatever. Um, you know, so they took that. Um, so, yeah, it, it, in that sense, it's very different. And it's interesting, for a long time, uh, after I, or while I was leaving and sort of after I left um, the Lubavitch community, and I would meet outsiders and I would talk to them about this. And first of all, of course, they were shocked <laughs> that I wasn't being, I wasn't taught any secular studies, but also because of um, all sorts of ideas about uh, gender discrimination and what have you, uh, female subjugation and so on, which are things that are definitely worth thinking about in relation to the ultra-Orthodox community. But because of, 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 of all those things, ideas, they tended to assume kind of intuitively, well, whatever the boys had, the girls had it even worse. So when they would hear that I didn't learn any secular subjects, they just assumed, obviously, the girls didn't either. But in this particular case, it's kind of flipped. um, Because they view the 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 kind of um, the Jewish uh, legal obligation to study Torah 
as primarily, if not exclusively, binding on the boys, they don't feel that girls actually have to study Torah. And mm-hmm. since they don't have to study Torah, they're really free to do whatever they want. And therefore, we might as well teach them how to read English. So again, the logic uh, is itself kind of sexist, but the outcome is that the girls um, in in in, in um, the schools that my sisters went to uh, did have a basic uh, secular education curriculum. Mm, so they're in some ways more well-rounded. Now, uh, as I was reading that you grew up in a family with eight siblings total. And um, as part of your upbringing, you also had to do a year in the outreach as, as a, I guess, a young emissary as part of your yeshiva training. And you went to Singapore, is that correct? Yes. Gotcha. How was, what was that like? Well, it was, it was really interesting and kind of pivotal for me. I mean, on the one hand, it was just fascinating being in Asia. I mean, the summer before I went to Singapore, I actually um, spent in um, Beijing also as an emissary doing, um, you know, religious outreach. Um, uh, but, um, but then, you know, in Singapore, we were there for a whole year. That was a really, you know, extended stay and, you know, it was just fascinating to be immersed to some extent in a, a totally different culture. Um, uh, it, for me personally, and my kind of um, religious, the development of my religious doubts, it was a really pivotal period because um, uh, coming from the yeshiva system that I was a part of, we had a tremendous amount of surveillance and scrutiny uh, of us the whole time. Mm. Uh, not that I didn't do any quote unquote bad things like read secular books. I ended up doing actually a great deal of that, but I had to hide them always. And there was a lot of, of subterfuge and, 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 and calculations going on. But when I got to Singapore, although we were sort of nominally under the authority of the Lubavitch rabbi there, the, the emissary who was stationed there with his family and children, because he had a wife and a whole family, as well as a whole community to take care of, uh, practically speaking, we were on our own. So me and the three other yeshiva students that, that I was joining uh, were really free to do whatever we wanted. And it turned out what I really wanted to do was read books. So mm-hmm. I ended up reading a ton of um, of classics. I read um, uh, Homer's Odyssey and the Iliad. I read Virgil's Aeneid. Oh. Uh, yeah, it was a very productive time of my life. I I, I really got to do a lot of uh, uh, sort of catching up. Um, uh, and I mean, I, I love that. I love books. Um, but also during that time, I decided... Um, that I was going to go to college, which is something that was completely forbidden within the Lubavitch community. Mm. And I learned about the GED because I didn't have a regular high school diploma because the yeshiva that I attended uh, um, uh, uh, didn't teach English. So they also had the courtesy of not giving me a high school diploma. So um, so I needed to get a high school equivalency, you know, in order to enter college. And then I heard about this thing called math, which, you know, I had no idea anything. I mean, they didn't teach us two plus two. They didn't teach us anything. So while I was in Singapore, I actually hired um, a Chinese um, uh, a woman to to come to my apartment and tutor me in basic math. I mean, just teaching me, you know, multiplication and uh, uh, um a little bit of algebra, a little bit of geometry, I really, you know, very basic stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, and the, 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 the interesting thing was that um, for the Lubavitch community, um, they're both very much opposed to secular studies, but they also have very strict rules about um, um, gender segregation. So men and women uh, who are not, you know, related are not supposed to be together alone you know, in a room or, and, you know, so I remember thinking that this woman would come to my apartment and uh, while the other guys were, uh, you know, doing other outreach activities, I was studying algebra. And I remember thinking, I wonder which thing would horrify them more. The fact that there was a non-Jewish woman in my apartment or the fact that she was teaching me algebra. Uh, probably both, you know, were really, uh, again, very much taboo. Uh, mm. But um, yeah, the time in Singapore, I used to, to great effect. I did a lot of work there, by the way, for Lubavitch. I, I, I taught uh, kids Hebrew. I helped um, make uh, Jewish um, holiday programs for the whole community. I um, 
I visited, there was a, a, a senior home for Jewish residents. I visited the seniors every week. It's not that I, I, I shirked my responsibilities, but I also managed to do a lot of extracurricular activities, let's say, that helped me develop intellectually and culturally. Hmm. It sounds like, was some of that maybe laying some of the groundwork for your, your exit later on, or would you say that was unrelated? Well, definitely it's related, definitely. But but I think one of the things that's interesting, and I actually, um, so as you mentioned, I wrote a book about people who leave the Hasidic community. And um, one of the things that I, I, I try to touch on in the book is that life is uh, just so much more complex than the kind of narratives that people use to describe their life, right? So if you ask people, you know, um, well, when did you leave? Or when did you decide to leave? People tend to try to um, come up with a kind of cogent, linear um, answer that, that, that mm -hmm. kind of takes them from point A to point B. First, I was in the community, and then some, you know, at some point, I made a transition, and then I left, you know. Um, but really, life is just the actual lived experience is so much more complex and multifaceted. Um, and then I think about my own story. Um, when I was in Singapore, and for years before that, when I was in yeshiva, and I was secretly, uh, you know, hiding out in my a dorm, while I was supposed to be in the study hall, studying Talmud, and I was in my dorm, reading history books. I didn't think, oh, you know, I'm trying to get out of this community or out of this lifestyle. And, um, you know, I'm going to, you know, read up on this stuff in order to help me get out or something. Right. You know, I, I just, I love books. I love knowledge. I wanted to know, you know, more than they were telling me about what's going on beyond the walls of the yeshiva, beyond the confines of, of my community. So I started to read. And the more I read, the more questions I had. So I read more. I just kept on reading, you know. And when I was in Singapore, the same thing happened. I mean, when I moved to Singapore, I brought with me a huge box with over 100 books. And again, there was no plan, you know, well, I'm going to read this, like, you know, and then it's going to, something is going to happen, you know, I just wanted to know, I was, uh, I was crazy about knowledge and, and trying to find out what's going on in the world and what are, how do other religions operate and how do other religious people think, how do non-religious people think, I mean, I just, I wanted to know all of it, <laughs> and um, reading, you know, helped me with some of that. No, with, I do want to ask about your exit um, in a minute, but a few final questions about your time before then. Did you feel like, I, I know that for, for Christians, for example, and I'm sure you, you, you know this, um, that Christians would describe their relationship with God uh, through Jesus as a personal relationship that, you know, that we, you know, are, are, are born in sin, you know, inherited from Adam and that we do bad things as well that we need a blood sacrifice and that when Jesus becomes a perfect sacrifice, it's not just a judicial transaction before God. I mean, it's, 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 it's certainly, certainly is that, that your God is declaring us righteous through Jesus's blood, but it, it becomes his personal relationship. Is it described in that sense with, um, you know, with, with, with God? Um, and by the way, are you comfortable with my using the, 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 the tetragrammaton or, or should I, should I stick with Hashem? <laughs> Whatever you want, that's okay. It's, okay. it's all well, good. Is it like a personal relationship with Yahweh, or is uh, would you pronounce it Yahweh, or how would you pronounce so it? So I, I would say that Jews in general don't usually describe God in the, in that way. Okay. Uh, not, I mean, yes, of course, there's a question of, you know, um, uttering the name of God or whatever, but just sort of culturally, that's not the way that that ordinary Jews either. Um, ultra orthodox or even sort of secular Jews describe God. Uh, okay. Most people would just say God, uh, or in 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 sort of orthodox or ultra orthodox circles, people might say Hashem, which literally means the name, which of course is a uh, 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 circumlocution or or, or uh, you know used in order to avoid saying the you know the actual of respect. name of God out of respect. It's considered sacred or whatever. But again, just kind of culturally, no one says Yahweh. Okay. That's, that's not, I mean, except for, you know, biblical scholars or something, and they're talking about, you know, different representations of God in the Bible or something. Uh, but, but just sort of average people, uh, Jewish people, um, again, Orthodox Jews might say Hashem, um, 
might say the Abishter, which means the the one above, uh, which is Yiddish. Um, you know, but whatever things would like they that. use the would they use the name Elohim or any any kind of straight up Hebrew no, names no. for him? I, I I mean I mean again people know what Elohim is I mean if you read Hebrew and you read the Bible or you read the 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 Siddur, the the Jewish um, uh, liturgical uh, uh, book um, you know it says Elohim so people know what that is but no one walks around saying that like like I mean it's funny just to take a a, a, a tiny detour um, I remember years ago in 770 as you you mentioned or you referenced earlier. Um, I was standing there one uh, one night on on Shabbat on Saturday, and suddenly there was this murmuring, and everyone said, "Watch out! There's cops here. There's undercover cops." And I'm like, "What? What?" Like, well, it turned out some, you know, crime had happened or whatever, and they were trying to figure out, you know, who did it or something. So they sent in a couple of agents into 770, you know, thinking that that you know they they know how to do this, you know, so. Uh, you know, they put on fake beards or they gave them yarmulkes, you know, skull caps or whatever, and they just kind of sent them in. And then it turned out, of course, that, you know, the Orthodox, ultra-Orthodox community has so many uh, rituals and practices, behaviors, tics, you know, that you could tell, uh, you know, a spy, you know, from a mile away. And in that case, it turned out that these very sort of ultra-Orthodox looking Jew people, you know, went over, they saw some women in the community. So they went over to them. They knew that you're supposed to say like, um, you know, good Shabbos, you know, a good uh, Sabbath. So they went over to them and, you know, uh, uh, reached out their hand to say good Shabbos. Well, it turns out that men and women don't touch in the community in public. So, uh, you know, right away, everyone's like, who are these people with the beards and the yarmulkes who are trying to touch women's heads, you know, but um, I mean, there's so many different things like this. So I'm just thinking like if someone reads the Bible or something and then they show up and they're like, so tell me about Elohim. Like right away, people will be like, who is this guy? <laughs> like that again, you know, in a, in a, in a seminar, seminary, a seminar on, you know, um, biblical history or something or biblical poetry. Sure. People talk, might talk about Yahweh and Elohim, but ordinary people in everyday ultra Orthodox life, no one says Yahweh or Elohim. Uh, if now, do they, they do the other part that we we talk about a relationship with with God, a, a personal relationship? Is that part of the the way they see it? Yes, very much so. And I would say again, going back to the history of the Hasidic movement, I would say that that. In a, in a sense, you could think of that as one of the innovations of the Hasidic movement in general. That that you know, for a long time. Um, uh, ortho, what we would call Orthodox Judaism, whatever. Again, the names, the, the titles become somewhat anachronistic, you know, you know, when you shift um, to different historical periods, but whatever. But sort of traditional Orthodox um, Jewish practice um, uh, for a long time, as I mentioned, was focused on a halakha, Jewish law, and the study of the Torah. Um, and, um, um, and, and it kind of had a sort of like a legalistic flavor to it, you know, where there are these things that you're supposed to do, and then you get rewarded or punished if you don't, you know, uh, follow the rules. Um, and that um, uh, the, the Baal Shem Tov and the Hasidic movement in general really did try to, to make religion, to make God more personal, that God is your friend, God, you know, you could speak to God, you don't have to, um, you don't have to be the, the grand rabbi, you could be a, a uh, a simple, you know, peasant, a simple person, you could speak directly to God. One of the famous stories that is often repeated about a Hasidic master who had a, a member of his community, a young boy who was illiterate. So he came to Yom Kippur, the holiest day of the Jewish year, and he wanted to express his his uh, devotion to God, but he couldn't read the Jewish prayer book. So instead, he just started to scream out "Kukuriku, Kukuriku," the, like the sound of a of a um, of a um, you know the the rooster, <laughs> the sound of a rooster. He was a farmer. He heard roosters all day, so he sort of made this kind of rooster sound, and all of the Hasidim around him wanted to throw him out of the synagogue. They thought, here's this crazy guy. What's he doing? You know, and the, the, the grand Hasidic master said, no, 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 leave him. What he's saying has more 
uh, you know, authenticity, more integrity than all of your prayers and devotions, because he really loves God, and he's sort of speaking directly to God from his heart, you know, and this, this is a story that's often repeated, um, and I think it exemplifies the idea that within the Hasidic movement, uh, it, the, um, the sense of having a personal connection to God, being able to speak to God, so to speak, um, even, again, not through kind of traditional codified forms like the prayer, um, the, you know, the printed prayers, but just making a sound, you know, uh, that feels authentic to, to the person um, mm -hmm. is very much a part of, of, of Hasidic life. Absolutely. Interesting. Would you describe it as real to you? Did you feel like you were close to God? Very much so. I mean, I, I, I really believed it. And I think that, I, I, you know, I've thought about this a lot because when people leave the community, so there's a need on the part of the community to try to explain, you know, what went wrong, you know? And, and I talk about this in my book. There's all sorts of tactics, rhetorical tactics that are used in order to, to try to delegitimize the decision on the part of the person who left uh, to leave. Um, and, and certainly one of the arguments that are, that are made is, well, this guy was a bum. You know, he was never a real Hasidic Jew. He was never really, you know, a part of the cause. And they can't say that about me. And I can't say that about me. I mean, I was very much a part of the community. I really believed it. I did read books, um, you know, secular books, which was uh, kind of a no-no. But um, other than that, I was a real straight shooter. I mean, I, I, I didn't talk to girls, which is a big thing you're not supposed to do. Uh, I didn't um, listen to non-Jewish music. I, I did watch some movies, which is also forbidden. Uh, but I mean, for the most, I had a beard, I had a long beard, that's a big thing, you're not supposed to shave or trim your, or pick your beard or something. Um, now you, your and, Chabad doesn't have the curls, is that right? Right, they don't have the curls, but they, they have their own operation with long beards, and yeah, they have their own kind of thing. Um, uh, but I, I had a full beard, I didn't um, uh, you know, pick my beard or anything like that. Um, you know, all in all, I was very much uh, sort of on a behavioral level, and and even more so on a on a internal level in terms of my 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 um, my beliefs, my feelings. I was very much a part of the of the community. I really believed that the Rebbe um, was the Messiah, the Jewish Messiah sent to redeem the world, which was a very uh, common belief among Lubavitchers and still is among many Lubavitchers. Um, yeah, well, I do I, want to ask some more questions about that in a little bit, sure. for sure. Sure. I, I absolutely really believe that. Um, I really, I mean, I believed in God. I really believed that that there is a, a God who created the universe, that God wrote the Bible, that every word in the Bible was, you know, God speaking to us. Um, uh, you know, these these things were, were my life. I mean, this was really the only life that I knew. And mm -hmm. a big part of the challenge for me, as well as many other people who leave the Hasidic community, is to try to develop a new sense of self, um, you know, away from or separate from the one that they inhabited while living in the Hasidic community. Mm -hmm. And again, for me, it was, the reason it was such a challenge is because my identity before leaving was really kind of totally connected to Lubavitch, to its beliefs. Um, I, I may, I mentioned that I went to Singapore for a year to do outreach. Uh, I also went to Russia uh, um, several years before that to make a, um, a Seder in a, a city in Russia. I, I spent a summer in Singapore, in, in, in China. Um, I went in various places around America to do Lubavitch outreach. I mean, I was very much a part of the community. Yes. And you, just by virtue of um, your, your yeshiva training, you had to, to really memorize and, and meditate on a lot of the, 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 the Bible, the Tanakh, the Talmud, and um, uh, is, is it the, um, what is the other one that you, the other book that you all would focus on in, in Chabad? The Tanya? The, the, is, is it the Zohar as well? Well, so I mean, this is kind of a little uh, in the weeds, but 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 the Zohar, of course, is a foundational text of of the Kabbalah. But the Bavitchers don't actually study the Kabbalah; they study Hasidut, which is you know Hasidic philosophy, which is gotcha. based on 
the Kabbalah, but they don't study the Kabbalah itself. So I did not okay. actually study um, the Zohar, although um, I sort of came across passage, passages of it that were referenced in Hasidic texts. Gotcha. Um, gotcha. But, but yes, I mean, growing up, we studied um, um, the the. Um, the Torah, the Tanakh, um, a great deal. Once you know we got older, and you know we're in yeshiva, uh, you tend not to spend as much time studying um, the Tanakh itself. Um, you study, uh, for instance, the Talmud, which is uh, rabbinic uh, writings that are, um, I don't know, um, from the third, fourth century uh, CE. Um, That's and, a whole set of like commentaries. Yes. Yeah, yeah, I mean the the Talmud is is a commentary on the Mishnah, and the Mishnah, uh, which was de um, uh, developed several hundred years before the Talmud, and the, the Mishnah is a, um, a rabbinic uh, sort of explication of the Bible. So it says in the Bible, you shouldn't. Um, do this, or you shouldn't do that. Well, what does that mean? So first, the rabbis in the Mishnah tried to explain, you know, what those things mean. And then, you know, several hundred years later, rabbis said, well, actually, we're not sure what the rabbis in the Mishnah meant. And so then you have these really long, um, you know, uh, discussions in the Talmud trying to uh, cl further clarify the meaning of the rabbis in the Mishnah, explaining what the Bible was talking about. Mm -hmm. um, so, so, yeah, I mean, just Do they the, see the, the Talmud or the Mishnah as inspired at all, or would they only see the, the Tanakh as inspired by God? No, no. On the contrary, they absolutely believe that, that the Talmud is inspired by God. In fact, there's a famous a statement from uh, within the Lubavitch community uh, that basically says that all of uh, sort of rabbinic writings up to uh, you know, these two particular legal codifiers in the 1700s or the 1600s was inspired by God. Mm. So, you know, it really brings down the, 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 the period of um, sort of divine um, um, inspiration, you know, till, uh, you know, very close to our time. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, no, this is absolutely in works that are inspired by God. And as you can imagine, um believing things like that um you know accepting that as a sort of um uh, a foundational belief uh before you approach these texts um ends up shaping um the study of these texts right so uh instead of opening up the text and saying well this doesn't make sense either one passage contradicts another passage or this passage contradicts reality. It contradicts something about science, about the natural world, about whatever, right? Instead of saying, hey, this passage is just wrong. And then you keep on going, you know, within the, the Orthodox and ultra Orthodox context, you actually have to kind of twist yourself into a pretzel to find some way to justify how it actually makes sense. So it's not yeah. um, the text that's wrong. You're wrong. Somehow you didn't quite get it. You are not uh, spiritually elevated enough. You're not smart enough. You didn't get the deep meaning that this third century scholar, um, you know, was thinking about when they made this statement. Uh, you know, so it ends up um, kind of uh, coloring the the type of uh, discourse that's permissible and the type of discourse that's uh, impermissible within the yeshiva um, um, education. Reminds me a little bit of some of the stuff that we see in, in Christianity as well. Um, I mean, some of it's literally, obviously, on the same the same verses, uh, just in, in in English for my my background, but versus straight up from Hebrew. But between that kind of dynamic and, and what we call the apologists, who are trying to defend it at all costs, despite the the chaotic and and dis discrepant nature of it all. But it, it reminds me of some of the stuff I've seen too. So you've you've painted this picture so far. So you grew up in this environment. You've been memorizing, meditating. You've been doing the emissary work as a missionary. Um, this is, it's, you're surrounded by it as your community, your siblings, your parents, um, the, the, the different teachers you have at the yeshiva. Um, all of your friends, it sounds like, are probably pretty much doing the same thing. It's your world. And, and you've, you've got a few outside influences, like, like the math and the, the other things you're learning. Take us, though, to the to the threshold, like what starts to make you think there's some cracks in the foundation besides just, I want to learn more, or there's more to this, there's more to life than just strict Chabad. 
like what what actually creates cracks that lead to your exit right so um so um uh, I, I should say that in my my book, I have a whole uh, little section called "Why Why is a bad question," okay. and I I basically try to argue that even though a lot of scholars uh, uh, seem to focus on you know why did people leave you know a particular religion, I argue that it's really very difficult, if not impossible, to pinpoint you know what was it that caused people to leave. Um, and I give it as an example, if you think about um, partners uh, uh, who get divorced, you know, and you ask one, well, why did you get divorced? Well, the truth is, it's often very, very hard to say. I mean, in some cases, you could say, oh, yes, because that guy's a, a, you know, a, a bastard, he, he cheated on me, whatever. Okay, fine. But even in those situations, is it really the infidelity that caused the marriage, the, the two people to split up. I mean, there's many marriages that stick together and it turns out that the people uh, still cheat on each other. You know, there's also marriages that fall apart and there's no infidelity present, right? So uh, again, if you think about it, it's, it's really um, uh, hard to say that infidelity is either a necessary or a sufficient explanation for why people get divorced. Um, mm -hmm. Instead, there's just many factors, often over you know, a period of years, where you know, small, tiny shifts in the dynamic uh, in the marriage uh, start to occur, and then those shifts have consequences, and you know, it goes on and on and on until at some point people sort of find themselves in a situation where they're getting divorced, you know? And I really think that that's the way it often works for not always, but often for uh, people leaving religion. Again, I, I, I'll mention, as I mentioned before, when we think about the narratives of people leaving religion versus the reality of, you know, what was their life like as they were leaving religion, you could see a real discrepancy. So yes, in the narratives, people might tell you, Oh yes, I left religion because I found out that my um, the spiritual leader of my community was a fraud. He was caught doing X, Y, and Z. Or I read the Bible and I realized this and that. Or I was gay and then I, you know, realized this was not for me. You know. So certainly in the narratives, there tends to be a fairly linear explanation. But I would argue that in people's actual lives, it's not so linear. So. Um, yeah. You know, I think that for me, as I mentioned before, when I was reading these secular books in yeshiva, it was not based on any kind of thought out plan that I was going to read them. And then this is going to lead to me leaving the community. Um, in fact, I remember I had one rabbi who sort of caught me um, uh, uh, red handed, surrounded by tons of these forbidden books in the yeshiva. I actually took them out because it was a right as I finished reading one book. So I needed to take out my collection to you know, uh, look through it and make a determination about what I should read next. And he happened to walk in in exactly that oh, moment. No. <laughs> and it was terrible. There, there was stacks of books. I mean, it's really very hard to you know, deny this. <laughs> so so he, he sort of caught me there and he's like, I mean, his eyes almost popped out. And he's like, well, what are you doing? What's happening here? So what am I gonna say, you know? They fell from heaven. God sent them, you know. So uh, uh, I'm I said, sure it's funny. That sound, I'm sure it's funny now, but I'm sure it was horrifying at the moment. Oh, I was terrified. I think I, my heart stopped. I mean, I was I was absolutely terrified. I, I mean, I, I really thought like I would die. I mean, it was and I really respected this guy. He was a brilliant guy, a really, really smart guy and a very nice guy. Um, and I was I was I was horrified. I was, you know, embarrassed that he would sort of see me doing, you know, connected to this dirty business of reading, you know, Shakespeare. Um, so, um, you know, so, so Just, uh, such a sinner. <laughs> yeah, yes, exactly. I was one of the worst. And, um, and uh, he asked me, Oh, what are you doing? And, and I, and I said, look, I, I like to read, you know, I, I just want to know what's happening. And he told me, you know, be very careful. You're playing with fire. You know, you read this today, one day it's going to lead you astray. And I said, absolutely not. God forbid, you know, I just want to read. I just want to know this stuff, you know. So maybe he was smarter than I was or had greater foresight. I was able to see that, well, yes, you know, knowledge does matter and ideas matter. And if you read enough, you might actually change your ideas. Um, you know, but the point is that 
I, I just don't think that in my case, there was a kind of, there's a neat story of exactly why I left. I wasn't beaten mm-hmm. in Lubavitch. I, I wasn't, um, you know, sexually abused. It turned out I knew a bunch of people who turned out to be sexual abusers. So, you know, I had like a sort of a close sort of connection to people who turned out were abusing other people in the community. But, mm-hmm. you know, thankfully I was sort of speared that, um, you know, so, you know, I, 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 I think, again, uh, sometimes they're within the sort of um, Exeter community, people who are leaving religion, whatever religious group, there's sometimes a narrative of escape, you know, that they got out, that there was, you know, that the community was this terrible place that was, you know, just full of these monsters that were abusing them and that it's just a horrible place. And that's really not my experience of Lubavitch at all. Um, there are many people there who are very warm to me. They're very loving, very caring, very sincere people. Uh, looking at them now, I, I certainly feel uh, a big gulf between us in terms of our politics. Um, you know, I think that they, they, you know, they tend to be much more uh, conservative politically, uh, socially. You know, so so the, you know there are real differences. Certainly, I don't want to paper over them. Um, but but I didn't have this kind of you know, horrible upbringing. Uh, my parents were loving people who, you know, made mistakes like old parents, but, uh, you know, certainly tried to do their best. Um, well, in terms of the, yeah. the, with you saying that there's, there wasn't one thing. Um, let me, I'll just use my, my story as an example. So I grew up as a conservative evangelical Christian from a young age, placed my faith in Jesus as my personal savior. Uh, you know, the his blood sacrifice was the culmination of the, you know, the mosaic sacrificial system. Uh, He was the final spotless lamb to take away this in the world. He was my, my righteousness. And I I placed my faith in him as a young boy. And pretty much I never questioned the narrative, Mm -hmm. even though I probably looking back when I had a lot of reasons that I should have or could have, but what started it was maybe the seed of when I looked at the stories of the genocide, like for example, there's a song that we would sing as Christians um, for you know, kids, a kid's song. We'd say Joshua fought the battle of Jericho. You know that song? Sure. And the walls came Robson. tumbling down. Yeah. And as I'm teaching that to, to my kids and we, ha- uh, we have four kids that are still little, four kids under age six currently, um, teaching that to the kids. I'm thinking in that story, in the, in the, in the narrative, if, if you were to continue that song with what really happens, they go in and slaughter people. Uh, that's genocide. And I'm thinking that's, I'm not comfortable with teaching kids that that's okay. And that, I would say that was among the many seeds, the many small pieces that it wasn't just like a, all right, I'm a Christian, bam, I'm an atheist. It was like, there's little pieces that begin to add up and the seeds begin to grow. Could you identify maybe one or two of the bigger seeds like that, that kind of took it? Cause, cause obviously it's at some point, if you were a believer in, in, in a deity and now you're an atheist, at some point there's a, ref, a time where you're going to reflect and say, you know what, if, if I'm, if I'm changing teams, so to speak, if I'm saying this isn't right, this isn't real, there's a, there's a de- a deconstruction and a deconversion that's happening at some point, at some, at some point you have to think, if this isn't real, then that is implications. And I want to go into more of what, what, um, you know, what you would believe about heaven and hell. But if you did believe in heaven and hell, for example, all of a sudden there's implications of eternity, even, you know, just the ramifications start to get bigger and bigger as you realize what's happening. So like what, what seeds or what junctures did you get to that kind of said, all right, this is getting, this is getting really intense. This is getting real. I need to figure out what's going on here. Right. So what pushed you over those edges? Right. So certainly, um, again, there were, there's, there are many kind of intellectual things where, um, you know, there's, uh, I think, uh, kind of a disconnect between what we were studying in the Talmud. I mean, so much of it becomes, um, you know, very, very minute discussions of all sorts of you know, tiny intricacies of, 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 of religious law. And, you know, I think in some ways I just kind of felt alienated from that. I mean, mm-hmm. like, does it really matter, you know, exactly uh, who's responsible if one guy's ox, you know, gores another guy's ox? Like, you know, um, it, it just doesn't feel or didn't feel like this is really the pressing things in my life uh, growing up in Brooklyn or, or, you know. So so I think that that's certainly kind of uh, loomed in, in the background. Um, at the same time, I would say that there are two kind of 
um, sort of emotional um, experiences that were um, that were that were very profound for me. Um, and I, I, I and I, I'm going to say what they were, but I just want to be clear. Again, what I what I was trying to get at before is that yes, I had these experiences, but at the time that I had the experiences, I didn't put all the pieces together. What right. I'm telling you now is sort of a retrospective look at my life. Well, I could see that those were clearly significant junctures of of sort of. Uh, you know, uh, departures, disconnects with my Hasidic upbringing, you know? Yeah, and I'd say um, do that for that in my experience as well. You, you don't realize what's happening until after it's already happened. It, yeah, that's what I mean by the narrative. That's what I was trying to get at, that people de- you know, reconstruct their life, uh, the narrative of their life, after the fact. They sort of put the pieces together. But when they're living it, they don't feel that, oh, yes, this is a significant moment, you know? No, yeah. it's only after the fact they say, well, I guess I really started to question things around that time, you know? Uh, so exactly. for me, two really powerful experiences. One was my younger brother, uh, 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 Shimon, Shimi. Um, he uh, uh, passed away uh, from leukemia when he was 12 and I was mm-hmm. 16. And again, I didn't think of all the... Uh, uh, um, um, you know the theological implications, uh, but but certainly, uh, you know, it was very traumatic for for me for my whole family. Yeah, I'm um, so sorry to hear that. Yeah, I mean, that, now you know this has been some time, but but obviously it's still it's still very painful, um, you know, to to think about it, and and certainly again at the time it was just a devastating experience that. I do believe now, in hindsight, um, you know, did spark my thinking. I mean, I I do remember. So again, I was 16. I do remember at the time, I didn't think of all the theological implications. You know, where is God? How could an innocent uh, child suffer so horribly? You know, Um, but I do remember thinking, wow, Shimmy died. He was 12. I'm 16. I could die at any time. You know, I really need to make the most of my life. And again, only later did I start to piece together that this idea of making the most of my life, that this is, um, and I actually remember, again, a bunch of years later, still in yeshiva, about 19, um, and I heard for the first time the Bon Jovi song, um, It's My Life. Um, I think I think that's the title of the song. Yeah, I know what you mean. You know, it's my life. It's now or never. I'm not. I'm not going to live forever. And I remember, like that hit me like a lightning bolt. I was like, Oh my God, that's absolutely true. Like I don't believe in an afterlife. I absolutely do not believe in afterlife or reincarnation, which are things that are prevalent in a uh, normative in the Lubavitch community. You know, this is the only life we have. You know, so at that point, I I wasn't necessarily atheist, and and certainly I was still religious, religiously observant. But you expected to but, see him again in, in heaven? Or, that before point? that, yes. Before yeah. that, definitely. Um, I mean, my mother, I mean, Lubavitch in general, they speak about heaven and, and we're all going to go to heaven and we're going to meet people, you know, our, our loved ones and so on. And and especially my mother, um, you know, really, uh, you know, would express this a lot, you know, and, and she's thinking about Shimmy right now and he's in heaven and we're here and now he would be, you know, 15 and, you know, or he'd be 20 and, you know, and, and we're going to see him soon. And, you know, this is, very much a part of our, our again, Lubavitch in general, but especially our family. Um, hmm. So, 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 yeah, I, I mean, at some point I realized, no, I don't believe in an afterlife. And I do believe like this is our only life. So whatever is important to do, we need to do it now, you know, in this lifetime. Um, and I think that that did have a strong impetus in terms of uh, making me realize ultimately, um, once I realized that I didn't want to be, I didn't believe in the doctrines of the community. Well, then I really shouldn't be here because I need to like live the life um, that 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 I want to live because there's only one life to live, um, you know. So that was really important. And the other thing, uh, which actually happened earlier, uh, was that the Lubavitcher Rebbe, who I was told for years was the Messiah and was going to reveal himself and take uh, us out of exile into a state of redemption and, and, you know, redeem the world and all this stuff. Uh, And he, and actually the whole purpose of creation was uh, uh, for the Jewish people to redeem the world. And uh, through the the coming of the Messiah and the messianic era. um, And here, 
we actually live right next to the Messiah, you know, in Crown Heights. Uh, he lives on President Street. We live on Crown Street. Uh, you know, we're, we're just a couple blocks away. And any day now, he's going to reveal himself. And then in 1992, he had a stroke, and he, um, which he never really recovered from. And then in 19, and it wasn't able to speak and, and different things like that. And then in 1994, he died. And I mean, this was traumatic uh, for, 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 for thousands of Lubavitchers. What well, does the reveal himself, what would that have meant if he had done it? Well, we don't know exactly because okay. it didn't happen. Uh, uh, I mean, I, I, well, I mean, really, we're, you know, no one knew exactly what it would mean. I mean, that was. Is it kind of like, 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 like God showing his glory, kind of like he would be re- something. doing something glorious? I, okay. mean, I mean, certainly on the most simple level, it would mean the Rebbe quote-unquote revealing saying openly i am the messiah Hmm. you know that that yes this is me i accept the mantle of of the messiah you know Hmm. you know so So he dies in 1994 and that there are some people though that still think he's not actually dead right right well there's there's complications uh which and, and scholars have referred um um you know um have made um connections between the early Christian, you know, communities and the, the Jesus people or whatever, you know, and the Lubavitchers today, you know, and how, you know, you, you, you develops all sorts of, um, um, uh, you know, uh, discourses and explanations for what's happening. Is he really dead? No, he isn't, or he is, but he's going to come back, you know, like in the early periods, there's, there's, you know, like uh, um, a flowering of different, you know, possible explanations. And then, you know, in the case of Christianity, if you give it enough time, there tends to be a kind of standardization and it says, no, this is the right interpretation. He never died or he did die, but he's going to come back, you know, whatever. Um, huh. So within the Lubavitch community, yes, some people said he never died. Others said, no, 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 he did die, but he's going to come back, you know. But either way, um, uh, definitely uh, even today, you know, all these years since 1994, um, there is a sizable portion. There's arguments internal and external in terms of the numbers, you know, whatever. But there's definitely a, a significant uh, uh, a portion of Lubavitchers who do believe that in one way or another, the Rebbe um, uh, is still the Messiah. And uh, we just have to, quote unquote, open our eyes and prepare ourselves, prepare the world or what have you uh, for this ultimate redemption. Um, and yes, I mean, it's a good question. What would it look like if he did reveal, reveal himself? Truly, it was never 100% clear. No one knew exactly because, you know, the, the texts were never so clear or so, um, you know, so there's disagreements. Um, I mean, going back, you know, a thousand years among Jewish scholars, what would the Messianic era look like? Obviously, the idea of the Messiah of a Messiah, a Jewish Messiah, is not a new concept. Uh, this has um, roots. Uh, um, I mean, there's sort of maybe hints at it in the Bible. If there's not really that much, but certainly rabbinic literature, um, there, there's, you know, a lot of discussion of this, which is, of course, how it ends up, you know, spilling over with into Christianity. Um, and so um, within, um, with, you know, within the, 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 um, the, the Jewish uh, uh, teachings, there are disagreements in terms of just how radical a change the, the coming of the Messiah will be. So for mm-hmm. some people, some rabbinic uh, figures, they argued that the coming of the Messiah would be a game changer. Basically, we would no longer have physical bodies. We would be like, mm-hmm. you know, pure spirits. We would just be like floating around in the you know, in the ether or something. And then other um, sages, including Maimonides, the famous uh, um, medieval commentator and physician, he said, no, 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 don't think that, that, um, that the coming of the Messiah is going to change everything. No, the world is going to stay more or less the way it is now. But there'll be some important differences. There'll be an gathering of the nation. So the Jews that are separated all around the world will come to, to Israel. There'll be a, a rebuilding of the temple. Um, and there'll be peace on earth. So Jews and non-Jews, you know, people won't fight. People will get along, you know, which is certainly a nice thing and a real change from what was going on in Maimonides' time and also uh, today. Uh, so, yeah, it wasn't necessarily clear exactly um, what form the messianic era would take, but certainly it would be at least somewhat different 
from what we had till now. And, and the Lubavitchers were hoping and, and, and waiting for this to happen. And then the Rebbe died. And, um, so, and again, I was only 12 then. Um, and I, 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 once again, I didn't think of all the theological implications, hmm. but certainly um, I was devastated. I mean, I cried. I, I couldn't believe that the Rebbe would die. I mean, not only didn't the Messianic era, um, you know, come about, but but the Rebbe died. I mean, we were told that the Rebbe could never die because the Rebbe is the the seventh leader of the of the of the Lubavitch community of the Jewish people, and that you know the seventh one is the most special one, and that this is the one that's going to usher us into the Messianic era. And instead of ha you know achieving all those things, he died. Um, so I mean, it was a, a truly uh, a devastating um, experience. And again, in retrospect, I certainly think that the Rebbe dying and my brother dying in different ways, um, both of these uh, um, deaths really, um, uh, really created um, um, you know kind of. Um, holes in my the foundation of my faith and then mm. as time went on and more and more things uh both from my um my the stu my religious studies as well as just learning about the outside world and traveling ironically on you know a, a, a missionary work um traveling to russia traveling to to china to singapore meeting all these different people seeing a little bit about different cultures uh, certainly made me reevaluate a lot of the basic ideas that were instilled in me uh, growing up including the idea that the jews are the chosen people we're the best people um the you know the jews are the most moral people the most uh, people who love their family the most the people who are the kindest and and all these things uh, what's about all the other people? I mean, all the nice people that I met, they didn't seem to conform to the kind of negative stereotypes that I was raised with. And I think that that really um, uh, ultimately had a, a devastating effect on my belief um, uh, in the Bible and God in the Rebbe and the Lubavitch system. Mm. I was going to say that um, definitely parallels a lot of things that I've heard with other people where they'll they'll see people of other religions or just people that don't believe the same thing and uh, it definitely it's a great venue for people to start thinking about that i did want to ask real quick just about the since you talked about the the rebbe um i was reading that and i'm just reading some notes here that according to some classical jewish sources uh the hebrew year uh 6, marks the the latest time for the initiation of the messianic age Apparently, the Talmud, Midrash, and the Zohar state that the deadline by which uh, Mes Messiah, Mashiach, must appear is 6,000 years from creation. According to tradition, the Hebrew calendar started at the time of creation, placed at 3761 BCE, and that the current, uh, <clears throat> me, the current Hebrew year is 5781, and therefore there is, uh, there is a deadline coming for when he must appear, and that's going to be like a parallel to the, to, uh, to 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 set the Sabbath, Shabbat, the seventh day of the week, basically the the, the day of rest. But instead of being a, a millennium, do you did they talk about that? Like there's a deadline where he has to come back by a certain time frame. Well, there there, there there's within the Jew, within Jewish history, there were a lot of people, a lot of rabbis that talked about Ketzayamim, the end of days. You know when. They were, they were like prognosticators. They, they tried to guess, you know, when the Messiah would come. And, excuse me, if you look throughout Jewish history, rabbis created all different dates. They said, oh, he's going to come by this year. He's going to come by that year. And, of course, each time, you know, these... Um, predictions were based on all sorts of intricate readings of the, the Bible, of the Talmud, of uh, a later, you know, of the Zohar and other Kabbalistic sources. And, you know, so, you know, these, this is a highly developed system of trying to come up with these deadlines. And in general, Lubavitch didn't really focus on that particular aspect of the Messianic, you know, belief system, you know, um, they essentially just decided the Rebbe is the Messiah. So like this, we've got it, you know, made, yeah. you know, this is, this is our guy and it's all, you know, going to work out just fine. Yeah. Um, but there, but this is a, a sort of a well, 
well, maybe not so well known, but but this is something that's documented anyway of these various deadlines. And then, of course, um, you know, the reality blows through the deadlines and then the Messiah doesn't come. And I'm sure you're familiar with um, Leo Festinger's uh, famous uh, book, uh, yeah. uh, Prophecy Fails. Oh, that's really great. You should read. Yeah. It's a, I highly recommend it. Um, yeah, we have a lot of date setters in Christianity too. I actually grew up listening to there was a, a Christian radio station out in California. Uh, it's called Family Radio, and it was probably fairly, fairly traditional and Christian. But the guy that founded it, his name was Harold Camping, and he he set the date for for the return of Jesus several times. <laughs> and I think it was it was at least two, maybe three times that he said it. But the third time, he was like, "I went back to all my notes, my numbers." I am sure this time, this is it. Like if this isn't it, it's all hogwash. Like I know this is it. And people were selling their homes so that they could basically like go buy like a, a caravan bus and just plaster with Jesus is coming back in six months. You know, repent. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. And they would just deplete their retirement accounts, everything just to just tell everybody it's over. It's Jesus is about to come back. And of course, you know, it didn't happen. But I, I find it fascinating too with the whole date thing. I don't know how familiar you are with the New Testament, but Jesus is is um, described with in this whole Trinity picture where he, he is separate from God. He's the Son, but he is still the same. He is it is you know one God, and you know I and the Father are one. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father, and so they are. Jesus is God, and yet even in the in the Gospels, he says to his um, disciples, "No one knows the day or the hour of you know when it's when this is going to happen." Even me, the son of man, I don't even know what date the father's got. Like, it's like, there's like this, I'm, I'm him. He's me. We're the same person, but he hasn't told me. And I, I always, whenever I look back on that, I think that, that probably should have been a sign that maybe there's some issues here, discrepancies you should think through carefully, but. Right. Um, but, but that's, but, but this is exactly the point that people don't even, you know, really smart people don't necessarily connect all these pieces because it, it, <laughs> Again, just life is so much more complicated than that. You know, maybe people, you know, in your church or community, you know, weren't focusing on that passage of the Bible, right? So there's so many passages. So they're focusing on something else, you know? So, you know, it's not that you couldn't find that passage or you were not aware of it, but you weren't necessarily focused on that. So therefore, this discrepancy between uh, the actual or a, a statement of Jesus saying, hey, don't you know, I don't even know when it's going to happen. So clearly no other human could possibly predict when this is going to happen. And then an actual human in California trying to predict when this is going to happen. Right? You could say, well, this is an obvious contradiction, but it's not necessarily so obvious uh, because people are not yeah. necessarily focused on that. And this is part of you know my whole thing that like, um, I mean, I could just tell you, I know that um, some people within the Jewish kind of Exeter community, you know, they often focus on all sorts of, of, of um, textual discrepancies, discrepancies between one verse of the Bible and another, just between a Bible verse and a verse or a passage in the Talmud, you know, and I always found this interesting, but also kind of beside the point, because mm-hmm. A, I felt like, what? So if you manage to find a way to reconcile the two passages of the Bible, then you're okay with the fact that God instructs the Jews to kill the Amalekites and, and basically commit genocide? Like, then it's okay? Like, you know what I mean? Like, I, 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 I don't know. I always just felt like this is not the the main concern for me anyway. Yeah. Yes. It's interesting, but it's an aside. Yeah. It's interesting, of course. And I, I read Spinoza and I I you know I read uh, uh Thomas Paine and I read uh um uh Ingersoll and I read you know uh, tons of other people who go through all sorts of nitty-gritty things but you know contradictions between biblical passages and it's interesting like any intellectual exercise you know but like that neither uh, uh of those contradictions uh, were really not the thing for me, you know, that devastated my faith, you know, uh, and if I managed to find a way to reconcile them, it wouldn't put my faith back together either. You know, mm. like, for me, I think that, and I, again, both on a personal level, but also as a sociologist, I think that faith is just so much more complicated than, oh, well, if you could get all your ducks to line up in a row, then you'll still believe. No, you know, why, what makes people believe and what makes people doubt or reject faith is, is infinite more complicated than simply you know reconciling a bunch of passages in the 2000 year old text mm-hmm. um yeah so 
So can I ask in terms of your actual exit, uh, you told me all, 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 before we started the, that you did deconvert to the point of atheism. Uh, as you're going through all of that, could I ask be, before you kind of made it clear to your family, to your, you know, to your um, teachers, to your, your, your people that were your peers, what did you fear was gonna be their reaction? And then could you tell us next, what, what was it? Was it was it as bad as you thought? Was it much worse? Was it different? How did that whole thing happen? And, and, and you know, start to pay, paint the path to, to where you are today. Sure, so, so that's a really interesting question. Uh, so uh, essentially, um, right. So there, there came a time while I was in college where I realized that I'm no longer a believer, that I do not believe in God. I do not believe that the laws of, of, of kosher, you know, are binding on me or that eating non-kosher beef or something is, is any, in any way, you know, morally reprehensible or is going to hurt me physically or any other way, you know? Um, and, and um, so I started to kind of break, you know, uh, um, some of the basic laws of Orthodox Judaism, like, the kashrut laws. So I would go to rest regular non-kosher restaurants and I would order, you know, hamburger or whatever, you know. Um, and, and uh, you know, and of course I realized that lightning did not strike me and everything was just fine. The burger was delicious. I was fine the next day, you know. And and so this start, sort of confirmed for me that, yeah, I'm okay. Like, I don't have to do these things, you know. Um, but at the same time, I still had a long beard. I still wore yarmulke. And I was absolutely um, um, terrified both of sort of um, kind of being attacked by neighbors, just people screaming, excuse me, screaming at me. I'm, I'm a sort of non-confrontational person. I like to get along with people. And I, the thought of having people kind of confront me, berate me, um, you know, was a very disturbing thing for me. And the idea of, of causing uh, harm, causing pain to my parents, to my family in general, but especially my parents, um, who I knew would be devastated at the idea that, you know, one of their sons is no longer Orthodox. And are you are you still the only person in the family that has yeah, exited? Yeah, I'm. I'm the yeah the only one who's sort of like this. Mm -hmm. um, um, I mean, I have you know other I have brothers who you know have questioned and and you know are still working their own things out. But I'm the only one who's sort of out and out atheist and the open black sheep. <laughs> uh, yeah, so um, openly sort of disconnected from the community and. And I knew that this would be a source of tremendous pain to my parents. And I love my parents. As I said, they, you know, I, I think they're wonderful parents, are wonderful parents. Um, and, and, I, and I was terrified of, of causing them pain and, and was sad at the thought that, that um, you know, my decisions could cause so much pain to people that I love. And um, I remember reading um, The Prophet um, uh, from Khalil Gibran, the the, uh, the the Middle Eastern poet, and he has a whole passage there about children, and he says that basically, um, you know, children, uh, the parents don't own their children. You know, the children are their own beings, mm. and and uh, you know they they could. Uh, you know, I mean, I'm I, I feel terrible because the, the the passage is so beautiful. Um, here, I'll I'll try to find it because it's really. Um, it's, <clears throat> It's, it's just a lovely, lovely passage. Um, um, but anyway, um, the, the point is, um, let's see if we could, uh, let's see if we could find yeah, it. Take, yeah, take your time. Um, so it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's a lovely, <laughs> I highly recommend it. Um, I've heard that, that author's name, but I've, I've not read any of- uh, Oh, I highly recommend, I mean, it's, it's very beautiful and very, you know, really deep. So here he is. Um, it's, so the, the name of the book is The Prophet. Um, and there's passages where basically people come, <coughs> people come to the prophet and ask him, what, you know, what do you say about this or that? And he, you know, has these really beautiful things to say. So I'll just read this passage. It's, it's, it's magnificent. Uh, he says, and a woman uh, who held a uh, babe against her bosom said, speak to us of children. And he said, your children are not your children. They are the sons and daughters of life's longing for itself. They come through you, but not from you. 
and though they are with you, yet they belong not to you. You may give them your love, but not your thoughts, for they have their own thoughts. You may house their bodies, but not their souls, for their souls dwell in the house of tomorrow, which you cannot visit, not even in your dreams. You may strive to be like them, but seek not to make them like you. For life goes not backward, nor tarries with yesterday. You are the, the bows from which your children as living arrows are sent forth. The archer sees the mark upon the path of the infinite, and he bends you with his might that his arrows may go swift and far. Let your bending in the archer's hands be for gladness. For even as he loves the arrow that flies, he also loves, he, he, so he loves also the bow that is stable. Um, and Khalil Gibran was uh, uh, um, born in 1883 and, and passed away in 1931. Anyway, for me, this passage was like, like a rallying cry. I mean, he says it right there. Children, parents do not own their children. They do not own their thoughts, you know. And I remember I actually once confronted my mother with this passage because we would argue sometimes about, you know, essentially my mother would say that it's the, the, the obligation of the child to, 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 to make their parents happy, that how could you go and leave the community when this is such a devastating thing to do to your, your parents? Don't you love your parents? If you love your parents, you know, how could you do this to us, you know? Mm -hmm. And I always said that, 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 yes, I do love my parents, but I believe that, that children have to make decisions for themselves. And if they feel that being part of a religious community does not feel right for them, then they have to go and, and, and make their life elsewhere, you know? And it's not my obligation or my responsibility to make sure that you're happy with my life choices. Mm -hmm. um, if we want to have a loving relationship, we have to agree to disagree, basically. But of course, for for the fundamentalist mind or the ultra orthodox Jew, where every part of life um, sort of connects to their Jewish commitment, and there are no sort of um, outside uh, or, or, or unrelated parts of life. Uh, no. The idea of having children and loving children who go off and, and are, are no longer orthodox. Uh, is, is just very hard to, to reconcile. So I told my mother, I read her this passage and I was like, it's, it's black and white. I mean, you see, he says it. I mean, this is so clear. Obviously it's right. And my mother, uh, she was sitting there chopping uh, uh, um, carrots for chicken soup uh, Friday afternoon, preparing for the Sabbath. And she didn't even look up. She just kept on chopping. And she said, uh, Zalman, did he ever have children? And of course, I had no idea. So I Googled it. And my bad luck, it turned out he didn't. And she's like, okay, so what do you want from me? He doesn't know anything about children. So, so, so that was, you know, uh, 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 that, that was the end of that. Um, but, yeah. but the point is that, um, the point is that, that for me, um, uh, uh, that was something that I was terribly concerned about, how my parents would react. And to make a long story short, and unfortunately I do have to go in a few minutes, so I will think about uh, trying to wrap it up. Um, but essentially, um, it, it was interesting in terms of the response. On the one hand, the community, like, you know, there really wasn't much of a response. No one ever rebuked me. No one ever berated me. Um you know, uh, I remember years later after I got married, and now I don't have it right this minute, but I have, I have a wedding ring, which is not common custom in the Hasidic community for men to have wedding rings. Women have rings. Men don't have any rings or jewelry. So I have a, a, a wedding ring, and I went um, I went back to Crown Heights for, for some family function, and I was standing around, and one of my old friends from yeshiva came over to me, and he sees, you know, like I, for Lubavitch standards, I don't have a beard. You know, I have a little beard, but not much. And, and then he sees the ring and he says, aha, so, so you don't have a beard. You have a ring. Like, basically, you're like a woman, you know. And this is meant to be this kind of devastating put down. And I mean, of course, it's absurd on so many levels. Uh, you know, I, 
you know, whatever. I don't look especially feminine or female, certainly. Uh, and more to the point, I'm not embarrassed or humiliated, humiliated by the idea of being associated with women. I, you know, I love women. I respect women. Sure, you think I'm a woman? Fine. What difference? You know, but for him, this was, you know, uh, uh, supposed to be this great... Um, this great barb, you know, uh, but that was, you know, but it was said in, you know, sort of a friendly, joking way, whatever. Uh, but for the most part, I really haven't had sort of nasty um, interactions with Lubavitch um, community members. Um, so that sort of didn't come to fruition. Uh, on the other yeah. side of the ledger, uh, in terms of my my parents, it's it was absolutely <laughs> as horrible as I had anticipated. Uh, you know, there were there were shouting matches, there were crying, there was, uh, you know, a, a threats of all sorts of bad things happening here on earth, as well as in heaven. Um, you know, it was it was very, very bad. Um, to, to the to the does the community include the option of shunning like they would in the Amish community? No. So there's no formal system of shunning. Okay. Um, and, and in fact, um, I mean, I mean, um, within Judaism, there is an idea of kerem, of a, of an excommunication, but um, as I mentioned a little bit in my book, uh, that really is not used today, um, you know, against religious deviance. Uh, for the most part, for the most part, uh, it's not really used at all. But to the extent that it is used at all, it's used for um, sort of um, I don't know people who uh, commit sort of business violations or something that disturb you know the harmony of the community. But mm -hmm. it's really not used very much at all, and certainly not against people who you know, leave the community, you know, religiously. Um, sure. So, no, we don't have that. And in fact, again, Lubavitch, because of its outreach work, um, there's a kind of incentive for for Lubavitch members to, um, you know, be nice <laughs> to the people who leave on the thinking that maybe, you know, we'll be able to get them back sometime, um, right. you know, and, and doesn't really happen too much. People who you know, really make a break with the community that they tend to come back. But there's certainly that motivation as well as just, you know, common decency or whatever. Do they, um, do they think you can still go to heaven and be right with God having made the choices you're making? Well, that's a good question. I mean, I mean, the short answer is I, I've never asked anyone that, you know, I'm really not looking to hear people's thoughts. I don't believe in heaven or God. So these are not things that particularly concern me. I don't stay up at night thinking, oh, my God, I, you know, I ate, uh, you know, non-kosher beef or I, I I turned on a TV on Shabbat and now I'm going to go to hell. And I, I you know, I and they're not sending you emails saying, hey, if you don't turn around from what you're doing, you're going to burn in hell. Not me, although I okay. have heard stories. I definitely have heard stories from people, mostly I would say in other Hasidic communities as opposed to Lubavitch that have gotten, you know, these kind of emails, text messages, um, excuse me, that start off friendly. Excuse me, you know, I want to help you, blah, blah, blah. And then once the person says, no, I, I really, you know, don't believe in God. I really don't believe in the Torah. I do not want to put tefillin on. I do not want to keep kosher or whatever. And then it turns into very kind of nasty stuff about hell and damnation and about whatever. But within the Lubavitch community in general, that's not really a part. I mean, they believe in hell, definitely. But, but, but the kind of rhetoric or focus on hell, uh, even among you know, even in terms of people who stay within the community, the idea of like focusing, oh my God, you're going to go to hell. Like that's not really um, uh, kind of focused within the Lubavitch community. I would say the Lubavitch community is much more focused on the Messiah. That's a really big deal for the Lubavitch community. And every good deed that you do or every Jewish commandment that you you fulfill, you bring the messianic redemption, you know, one uh, one drop closer, you know. So, so that... In that sense, it's a much more kind of positive message. Um, uh, so yeah, in general, they don't speak. I mean, they, you know, we studied, you know, some things about hell um, growing up, but but that's not really the focus in the community. And then certainly for people who leave, again, in my experience and from what I've heard of, from other people within the Lubavitch community, they tend not to get that kind of um, helpful text messages and emails, but certainly in other Hasidic communities, um, very much so. That that certainly, um, you know, exists. Um, I yeah. should also say about my family, 
even though we did go through this period that was you know, really um, sort of acrimonious and, and painful for everyone, um, I, I will say that we managed to sort of get through that and we now have a very loving relationship. Um, it's That's not awesome. uncomplicated, you know, if you're, you know, relatives believe very fundamentally different things from you about religion and God and also about politics and stuff. Um, you know, there could be complications, but everyone has managed to to sort of see the bigger picture that we're one family. We love each other, and um, and we're you know. So we've been in a very good place for you know for for a bunch of years now. Um, my wife and two two young girls, we go to visit Crown Heights, you know, on a regular basis. Um, I mean, not only for family weddings or bar mitzvahs or other celebrations, but also, you know, just to visit. So, um, yeah, we, you know, we, we've managed to sort of come through this and, um, and uh, yeah, I, I mean, I'm very, I'm very, very glad of that. Hmm. Well, kind of to, to, to wrap it up, and I, I have a lot of other questions, so maybe we can <laughs> chat again sometime. But just to wrap it up for tonight, um, I know that you, you know, you're, you're speaking of your story after it's, you've obviously had a lot of time to process it, to sit back. You're telling it matter of fact, you're telling it even with, with some humor, but that at the time it was probably very, very painful. Um, and I'm, I'm assuming from your, your research, that you've seen some pretty sad stories. Um, <clears throat> what would you say would be the biggest lesson you've learned about helping people that are either maybe they in their mind they've already exited they just haven't taken the steps yet or maybe they have started to and it's just it's just getting painful both personally with their family or their or their um their peers there in the community um or even with a you know a spouse you know maybe they maybe the spouse wants to stay and they want to leave like just the emotional strength the I think the word I've, I've read somewhere, the, the chutzpah, the, 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 the guts to say, I'm going to do this. It's, it's, it might look crazy to you guys. Um, I might be Meshugana, but I'm going to do it. I'm going to, you know, this is, this is, it's time for a change. What kind of messages do you find yourself saying to people like that, where they're just like, this is, this is hard. It's getting harder. And I think it's actually going to get even harder before, <clears throat> before it gets to a, a more peaceful um, place for my life. And they're like, I got to do it, but this is, this hurts so much. Like, what do you find yourself saying to them? Right. Well, the one thing, I don't know. I mean, I would, maybe I would say this to them, but just a kind of observation about people in that situation. And certainly for me, there were, you know, there was a, a period of years where it was extremely painful. And, and, and I even, um, you know, had sort of thoughts about suicide and uh, it was an extremely painful period. And I also, uh, um, speaking of, Kind of getting through it and ending up in a better place. I have been uh, 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 off and on in therapy for a bunch of years, which I highly recommend uh, to everyone in general. I think people uh, could um, therapy could do a lot of good for a lot of people. A Most, secular therapist, secular. Secular. Therapist. <laughs> well, well, I, well. I would say licensed therapist. Yeah. That, that that you know, um, there is within the Orthodox Jewish community. I'm sure within Christian circles, um, people who sort of uh, present themselves as therapists or life coaches, and they don't really have you know, um, sort of secular credentials, you yeah. know? So I would argue, and I've actually told this to, to numerous people, I don't think the main criteria is the kind of religious status of the therapist, you know? Mm. I don't want to, A, I don't want to sort of discriminate, uh, but also I don't think it's necessarily helpful, you know, that you're going to get the best therapy if you go to someone who's secular, that they're not religious. Gotcha. Um I think that there could be benefits to people who are religious, who, who really know the community which you're coming from. They understand the language, they have the cultural sensitivities, and also the kind of communal understanding of your situation. And, and sometimes you could get the best advice from people who are kind of intimately familiar with it. But there are two yeah. The two conditions. The first one is they must have secular uh, kind of formal training, uh, both so that they know what they're doing and they're not just winging it, and also so that they've had hopefully at least some uh, time to, uh, you know, in some space to reflect on, you know, human psychology or whatever, separate from their religious, you know, training and, and, and feelings. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? So yeah. I think that that's the first thing and the second thing and 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 of course it is possible and there are horrible stories of religious therapists 
or even people who are trained and are credentialed, who essentially are, are propagandists, are, are apologists for their religious community and actually use their, their, their secular credentials in a very nefarious way that they basically um, you know, um, dress up you know, belief in God or you know, following the norms of the community uh, using psychological terminology, but it's ex essentially very manipulative, trying mm. to get the person who's in real pain and, and, and you know in extreme situation to 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 doubt themselves and to come back to the community, and that is you know a terrible terrible thing. I think people who do that should be you know should lose their license, but whatever. Um, mm. But what I would say. Um, my second sort of con condition or, or, or advice for people trying to find a therapist is don't necessarily look at the, um, you know, the religious status of the therapist, look at their formal credentials. And if you, you do go and start therapy with them, you know, use your brains, you know, look, are they telling you all of your quote unquote heretical thoughts are you know, expressions of your ego, expressions of whatever, and therefore you really should just come back to the religion and the faith, and then everything will be good. If they're saying that, then they're hacks, regardless of what they have on, you know, what diploma they have on the wall, and then you shouldn't go to them, and, you know, then you should drop them and find someone else. Um, but I, so I think that, that that's the advice, sort of practical advice in terms of therapy. Um, but the, 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 the more general point I was, I was going to make is that I think because the, the process of leaving is so painful and it is really traumatic uh, for most people, um, that I think that people don't really undertake it unless they've already decided that they simply cannot live, you know, in the state that they're in, they cannot stay in their religious community, you know, so in other words, no one makes that decision lightly, no one who's sane makes that decision lightly, you know, people understand that even if there are not formal systems of shunning, this will be a very uh, um, a traumatic experience for them, for their family, with all sorts of consequences, you know. So people who are making this decision, who are making the move to actually sort of publicly distance themselves from their community, whether they're going to leave to go to a different, you know, live in a different place, or just sort of come out um, in, in whatever way to say, hey, I don't believe in this anymore. I'm not a part of this church or this synagogue or whatever. You know, they've already gone through a tremendous amount of... Um, you know, uh, thinking and calculations uh, and, and, and really determined that they simply cannot live there, you know, cannot live that way. And it's only really people who have come to that place who end up making the move, because otherwise, no, you know, no one undertakes it on a whim. In other words, no one says, what the heck, I'll, I'll just try it out. I'll see if, you know, having all my neighbors, uh, you know, think I'm crazy or whatever, if, if I like the feeling, you know, um, yeah. So in other words, I think that people who are at that point, they really need to believe in themselves. You know, even if they don't believe in God anymore, they really need to believe in themselves in their own intelligence, in their own morality, in their own integrity, you know, and they shouldn't feel, well, because I was told that to leave the community or to doubt God is, you know, is a sin, is an abomination, is a, you know, makes me a bad person. You know, they really need to uh, not listen to those messages. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, again, it's not for everyone to leave. Even, you know, people who may be atheists may stay in the community um, uh, because they don't want to deal with all of the fallout of actually leaving the community. And that's understandable, you know, I get that. Um, but for people who decide that they do want to leave, they really have to, um, you know, dig deep in themselves and realize that they have the, the, um, the, the, the human intelligence and the, the, the basic decency and morality and integrity um, and authenticity to decide for themselves what is their proper lifestyle. Um, and the only other thing I would say in terms of dealing with family or, or neighbors or other people, um, and again, it's hard to generalize. Everyone is in you know different circumstances, but I would say that you know you really want to, even though you know uh, someone who's leaving may be in a lot of pain themselves, 
uh, understandably. Um, we want to try as much as possible to also see things from the other side. I don't mean in terms of your decision to leave, but just in terms of how you relate to the people who are staying. You know, I think there's a natural tendency to to um, you know to feel very righteous, uh, you know, about the decision to leave. And then I think that could sometimes shut down communication or make it harder to, to communicate in a helpful way. You know, I think it's important for people who are leaving um, to be clear with their family or other people that they're connected to, you know, um, and, and say, you know, why they're leaving, that this is not something that they're undertaking on a whim, that they've thought about this maybe for years, they may have studied, they may have prayed on it, they may have, um, you know, searched their soul, and that this is where they end up, this is where they are, um, but that they should try to, to be as loving as possible to the people around them, the people that they're trying to stay connected to. Obviously, if there's, you know, just negative people who, who they don't want to be connected to anymore, you know, that's fine. They could, you know, walk away from them. But people that they would hope to, to stay connected to, they should try to be as loving and as understanding. And and I, I, I'll say one thing that... Um, one other thing uh, related to this, which is that for the people who are leaving, as I mentioned, they tend to think about this for years. Um, and I know that I did, that this was not something I took uh, undertook lightly or, or on a whim, you know, so I had sort of prepared myself mentally, emotionally for my departure. But because, as I mentioned earlier, like, I was a very good boy, I was very much a part of the community, like, no one, even my parents had no idea that I was going through this whole process. So for yeah. them, it was really a total shock, you know? And some uh, there's a scholar who talks about uh, this kind of dynamic in terms of uh, divorce. And she says that often there's one person, one partner who initiates the divorce and the other partner who's being divorced. Well, the partner who initiates the divorce tends to uh, think about this for years and tends to have a whole plan for how they're going to go about this and how their life is going to be once they, they get divorced. But for the partner who's being divorced, it often comes as a total shock. So they're not prepared for it. And therefore, it's often hard in the moment for them to respond in a kind of loving or, or, or even... Um, um, a helpful way, a practical way that could help, you know, the process along. And I think there's the same kind of dynamic when it comes to religious exit. For the exeter, they've thought about this for years. This seems like the most obvious, often the only option available to them. But for their family, their partner, as you mentioned, sometimes you have a, a, a situation with spouses, you know, the spouse and the, the parents or family or neighbors, they may not have an inkling of what's going on. So when the person reveals to them what's happening, they may be in shock and therefore they may res might respond very harshly or in a very um, you know, unloving way. And yeah. I think it's important for the exeter just to be cognizant of this dynamic, not to, um, to, to justify any kind of harsh response in the part of other people, but just to be cognizant of this dynamic and, and, and sort of give them time um, and be as gentle as possible under the circumstances and give them time to kind of um, you know, come around to whatever extent possible. Yeah, that's very good advice. And do you get a lot of like letters or emails from people saying, "Hey, I'm, I'm in the same boat you went through, and I, I just feel alone." Like, do the do you kind of get people asking you for counsel or just a listening ear to say, "Hey, can can you just tell me I'm not alone in this?" Does that happen much? I, I get some. Thankfully, not so much. Only in the sense that I'm not a a mental health professional. As I was saying, I have a PhD in sociology, not psychology, which I, my, as you mentioned, I was a psych major and I was actually planning on becoming a clinician and I didn't. One of the many things my mother thinks I did wrong. Um, but, but you know, I'm not a trained professional and, and I would be very uh, weary of giving, you know, uh, you know, real advice to people leaving a religion. I think that they, they should speak to professionals really. Um, you know, as I was saying before, um, being in therapy, speaking to a professional really could help to, to, to deal with some of the emotional debris from a religious exit. And, and obviously it is a very traumatic thing for the person leaving as well as the people who are connected to them. Uh, mm -hmm. but, but yeah, I don't get so much of, of sort of, um, 
requests for, for practical advice, but I do get people who left who tell me that they love my book and that they feel that reading the book was actually a very um, gratifying thing psychologically because they suddenly learned about so many other people who were in their situation. And when they hear, when they read, you know, um, my discussion of these dynamics, they say, oh, yes, that happened to me. That's just like my situation. So in that sense, um, you know, uh, besides for hopefully uh, contributing to the, the um the scholarship on this topic, um, I hope in some small way to help people who are actually struggling through these issues uh, feel less alone, feel recognized, feel, you know, heard, acknowledged in some way. Yeah, that's awesome. I, I would say uh, ditto on that too. It's, it, it absolutely is true that when you're in the community, from my perspective, the Christian community, there's a very sheltering dynamic and you don't know that there's a bunch of other people that have questioned stuff because they just most of the time they kind of quietly drift off into the night they be kind of you know maybe leave the church and you never know that they've gone into atheism or something and once you leave though and you find yourself making those connections you find out a lot of other people ask the questions that you eventually asked that got you out like for my case it was it was boiled down to what is the actual origin of judaism what is the origin of christianity you get these questions, you get some of the deep answers and you find out people have been asked this question a long time before you do. And you almost feel like, I feel like, you know, I wish, I wish I'd known more people were questioning it because, you know, you never know, but maybe I would have gotten out earlier and I would have loved to have gotten out earlier if I could have, because it obviously feels like a great deception. But I do want to wrap up just by saying a couple quick things. Thank you for writing the book. I've not read it yet, but I do intend to shortly. And, um, Thank you just for your example, because there's there's a lot of people, like I just said, that just kind of they leave and they drift off into the night and you've created a, a little platform that I hope it just keeps expanding and your voice gets bigger in this because people need to know there's people like you that have gone through it, that, that it's been painful and it's for you to say, hey, it's, it's worth the pain to get back to reality um, and that it's going to be OK. I mean, I think a lot of people just need to hear. It's, it's going to be okay. You know, this is going to hurt, especially not just the community stuff, but even just like your personal relationship with God stuff. Like it, it's a killer. It's, it's an emotional, psychological killer to think I expected to spend eternity in heaven with loved ones that have gone on, you know, with maybe if I'm sick, that I'll have a perfect body. I'll live forever. And to, to, to have all these important things to you suddenly just fall apart. It, it's painful. And for someone to come on and say, Hey, it's, I know it's painful, go through the pain, but it's going, you're going to come out the other side. It's going to be okay. And I appreciate that you're doing that. And I just, I hope people find your book and, and get encouraged by it. I wanted to also end with two other things. Um, I may have this wrong, but I think I read this quote from the Rebbe saying, when two people meet, it should benefit a third. Have you ever heard of that quote? Yes. Yes. Very much so. Okay. So I want to say, I hope that this, that this discussion between us two, it can benefit a third person or more. And uh, the people do find encouragement. And that, in my channel, I've got some other people. Uh, I'm, out, I'm also interviewing, you know, people about scholarship questions about the origins of Christianity, but I'm more interviewing some people, just, just people that have just left, you know, there, there's nothing more to the conversation than I learned something about my religion and it led me out. Um, but I hope people find encouragement either through my channel or, or others like it. And then I know that I've heard people say that um, a good way to end things is with the phrase l'chaim. Is that correct? Sure, sure. sure. L- uh, l'chaim is just like saying, good, you know, have a good life or to life, right? Right. I mean, l'chaim means to life. It's used usually like in the sense of like cheers, you know, okay. or nazdaravna, uh, you know, every... You know, culture, religion, or, or, or um, language has some expression for that. Uh, so, um, within the, the Jewish community, um, l'chaim again means literally to life. And people uh, in Lubavitch, they use it very often. Um, you know, when they're drinking. Um, but uh, sure, we could say to life, to living a a, a, a truer, more authentic, healthier, um, science-based, loving your neighbors, all of your neighbors. Um, you know, that would be a, a wonderful way to, to live and a wonderful a way to end off, uh, you know, to say goodbye. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I'll do it that way. <laughs> 
Take care. This was so lovely. Uh, I really uh, enjoyed our conversation. I would just say that if anyone wants to learn more about me, about my book, uh, you could go to my website. Uh, it has a very creative name. It's my name, zalmanufield.com, and it has a bunch of um, things there about my book, about articles that I published, other things uh, that people might find interesting. But this is so lovely. I'm so glad that we did this. Awesome. Well, thank you. And I'll have those links beneath the video if people want to click right there. And uh, Dr. Newfield, thank you so much for your time. This has been awesome. I loved hearing your story. I appreciate your encouragement. So thank you again. Take care. All the best. Thank you.